Acts chapter 2. Did you come this morning anticipating the move of God? Did you come this morning expecting the move of God? Absolutely. Praise the Lord. In Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, there is a great day of expectation. All y'all quit saying amen. There's a great day of expectation. There's a great day of anticipation. The disciples had walked around with Christ. They had been with him. They had seen him arise and gone amongst the clouds until he was no more. The angel said, go to Jerusalem. This Christ that you saw go away will come again. Go to Jerusalem, wait for him. They go to the upper room. They're waiting for him. There's anticipation. There's about 120 of them there in the upper room. They're wondering what in the world is going to happen. There is a great day of anticipation. Oh, church, we should come into worship every time with a great day of anticipation of what God is going to do. Because God, if we come in with our mind focused on him, God will do something in our lives every time we come into worship service. Great day of anticipation. The disciples were wondering what's going to happen. Jesus had been born. We just celebrated that this week, right? He had ministered. He ministered for three and a half years. Fed the 5,000. They were there, probably there on that hillside. There were closer to 15,000. And he fed them all. He walked on water, raised the boy from the dead just by touching his casket. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He preached. He confronted the Pharisees. He was crucified. He said from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And the price was paid. His side was pierced. Out of his side, blood and water flowed. He was taken from the cross. He was laid in a tomb. A stone was rolled in front of the tomb, but on the third day, the stone rolled away. He walked out as the ruler he is, holding the keys of death and hell. And that's where Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, there's a great day of anticipation. After his resurrection, the disciples talked with him. They walked with him. They ate with him. He gave them instruction, go to Jerusalem, wait for the Spirit. Now on the 50th day after the resurrection, the day of Pentecost, things are starting to get exciting. As if they weren't exciting already. There is anticipation in the air, just like there is at Christmas time, just like there is at New Year's, when there's a new decade coming on. And we start to wonder, will our computers handle it? <laughs> will our cars die on January 1st? Will our computers quit working on January 1st? When we walk outside, will the airplanes come crashing down on January 1st? Lord, I hope not because they fly over my house. <laughs> 
I mean, there are people who sit at home and worry and think about these things as we approach the end of this year. Will that blasted phone finally quit on January 1st? Oh, I hope so. (laughs) Because then I'll have peace. There was great expectation and great anticipation in not really sure what was coming. And Jesus knew, or just all they knew was that Jesus promised that something was going to live in them. With all that being said, let's look at Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 1. When Pentecost, the 50th day after Passover came, all the believers were together in one place. And suddenly, a sound like a violent blowing wind came from the sky and filled the whole house where they were staying. Tongues that looked like fire appeared to them. The tongues arranged themselves so that one came to rest on each believer. All the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability to speak. Now devout Jewish men from every nation were living in Jerusalem. They gathered when they heard the wind. Each person was startled to recognize his own dialect when the disciples spoke. Stunned and amazed, the people in the crowd said, All of these men who are speaking are Galileans. Why do we hear them speaking in our native native dialects? We're Parthians, Medes, Elamites. We're people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and the province of Asia. Phrygia, Pamphia, Egypt, and the country near Cyrene and Libya. We're Jewish people, converts to Judaism, and visitors from Rome, Crete, and Arabia. We hear these men in our own languages as they tell about the miracles that God has done. All of these devout, devout men were stunned and puzzled. They asked each other, what can this mean? Others said jokingly, they're drunk on sweet wine. Let's pray together. Father, we love you this morning. And we have come to praise you. And to worship you. And to learn from you this morning. We have sung some. We have sang some songs of Zion. We've read your word. We come anticipating a move of your spirit today in our lives. Speak to us. Break us and remake us into the image of your Son. And we thank you and praise you for what you are going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The day of Pentecost, this was one of the most phenomenal and one of the most important events in all of history. Now, some of you, if you've been here on Wednesday nights, you'll get a refresher course of some of the things that I'm going to share this morning, and that's okay. Right? Yeah. Right? I mean, after all, you get a refresher course on the tabernacle almost every year, right? And sometimes several times a year. And I've heard many of you say after you get that refresher course, wow, I didn't know that. And yet we've taught about it. Never mind. <laughs> So some of us, we're going to get a refresher course on on the day of Pentecost, and that's okay. There's several reasons why this event is so important. It was the coming of the Holy Spirit. It was the birth of the church. It was the corporate filling of the Holy Spirit of the body of believers with the promised presence of Christ. 
It was the personal filling of the individual believer by the Holy Spirit. It was the presence and power of God coming on believers, gifting them and equipping them to proclaim the glorious message of salvation. The Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost was important. Obviously, because it made a big stirring mass that day, didn't it? It caused quite a ruckus that day, didn't it? It drew a lot of people that day, didn't it? Oh, you see, when we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, it draws people to... So all you introverts... I love the Word of God. God God is so awesome in how He shows off at times, you know? It, it, it also shows His providence. I, I, it, I, when, when, when I taught this on Wednesday night, we talked about the Feast of Pentecost. And so let's just take a moment, because we're going to review it, because we really need to understand on what is going on here. If we don't grasp it, we won't really get excited about the day of Pentecost. And if we don't get excited about the day of Pentecost, then we won't get excited about being filled and driven by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we need to. And, and, and if we don't do that, then we won't get excited about the coolness of God. We really won't. The great gift that is given to each one of us and the excitement about the Word of God. A lot of people tell me the Word of God is boring. But you know, when you really dig into it, it's really exciting. And it's really cool. And it's not just exciting to preachers, it's exciting to people when you allow the Holy Spirit to really work in your life. Okay, so we're going to dig into it. Pentecost is also known as the Day of First Fruits, or the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of Harvest. Pentecost was a glorious day of celebration, a day when the people were to keep praise and thanksgiving on God. Now, you might ask, why? Right? Of course. Why on this particular day? Shouldn't we be keeping praise and thanksgiving on God every day? Well, those are good questions that you ask. And the answer is yes, we should. We should be keeping praise and thanksgiving on God every day. We should be heaping praise and thanksgiving on God all the time. Think think about the things that he has done just this morning. You're up. You're here. You're breathing. You arrived safely in the rain. You have clothes on, praise the Lord. Most of you ate something this morning. Some of you had coffee, either at home or here. Praise the Lord for the coffee station that is sitting out there. Amen? Thank the Lord for the freedom we have to worship. Thank the Lord for the victory we have over sin. Thank the Lord for the victory we have over sinful habits. Thank the Lord for the renewing of our minds. Thank the Lord for the freedom to worship in spirit and in truth. Thank the Lord that he, that he, he, if he never did another thing for us, yet I will praise him. Yet I will serve him. Yet I will follow him. Yet I will choose him. Thank the Lord that he called me. 
When I think about where I was, when I think about the choices I made, when I think about the choices I continue to make, when I think about what I've done, when I think about where I should be right now, but God reached down to where I was and he pulled me out and he saved a wretch like me. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. All because of God's amazing grace. You bet I'm going to walk in here and I'm going to praise him. You bet I'm going to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. After all, when you go to talk about Jesus, you're talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, 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 if that didn't make you happy enough this morning, I, I want to take a, a portion of a sermon that I read this week and that I've read before, uh, but I was reminded of it this week from a, a pastor by the name of H.M. Lockridge. And the pastor says he's king of the Jews. I mean, he's describing Jesus this morning. He's king of the Jews and he's king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of the heaven. He's the king of glory. And that's why we praise him. That's why we give him glory. That's why we worship him. He's enduringly strong, entirely sincere, eternal eternally steadfast, immortally graceful, he's powerful, he's merciful, he's God's son, he's the sinner's savior, he's awesome, he's unique, he's unparalleled, he's unprecedented, he's the fundamental doctrine of true theology, he's the cardinal necessity of spiritual religion, he's the miracle of the age, the only one qualified to be an officer Savior. He supplies strength to the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tired. He sympathizes and he saves. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick, forgives the sinners, discharges the debtors, delivers the captives, defends the feeble, blesses the young, serves the unfortunate, regards the ages, rewards the diligent. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring to wisdom. He's the doorway to deliverance. He's the pathway to peace. He's the roadway to righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. His office is manifold. His promise is sure. His light is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never Never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy. And his burden is light. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. You see, that's my king. And you bet when we gather together. There's going to be a praise on my tongue. There's going to be a word of thanksgiving on my tongue because there's a king who is above all kings who is sitting on the throne at the right hand of the father interceding for you and for me right this very moment and not you not me not the president not the Saudis not the terrorists not ISIS can knock him off that throne Satan couldn't touch him this morning and on the day of Pentecost the Holy Spirit came and began because of that day, greater is he that lives in me than he that lives in the world. That's my king this morning. So yes, there's a little bit of excitement that day. Yes, there was some thrill that day. Yes, there was a crowd that day. 
But look at God's providence. Pentecost was a glorious day of celebration. And I've got three points that have 20 million sub points. And I figure, you know what, I'm driving to Cleveland this afternoon so y'all can sit here and wait. I'm the one going on the road, right? The first reason there was a celebration on that day because the Holy Spirit came, it was because of the harvest of the fields. The very name of the feast says it was a celebration of the first fruits. It was celebrated when the first fruits of the harvest began. Now, this was around the first of June. It actually opened up the harvest season. Think about that for a moment. Don't you just love it when the vegetables start to ripen in the garden? <laughs> I know, I know in our society today, in our day and age today, we don't have many gardens anymore. Right? Not many people plant gardens anymore. We just go to the store and buy whatever's in the store and realize that there's a lot of callbacks, <laughs> recalls, you know, because this has got E. coli and this has got E. coli and this has got, you know what doesn't have E. coli? Bacon. <laughs> Can't go wrong with bacon, okay? But, but you know, Dawn and I have a garden. We have a garden, and I look forward to that fresh asparagus, those fresh tomatoes, those fresh potatoes, that spaghetti squash, the zucchini. Dawn does such an awesome job at keeping the garden watered, weeded, and I do a great job at eating what she brings in the house. <laughs> Teamwork. <laughs> That's what marriage is all about. <laughs> Teamwork. This day, the day of Pentecost, this, this day was a great day of celebration because it was harvest time. The day of first fruits. And they were celebrating the harvest time. The second reason for celebration on this day is because of the exodus. The, the deliverance of the nation of Israel from Egypt. The people were to thank God for being delivered from slavery. Now, I don't know about you, but if I have been delivered from slavery, I would do a little bit of rejoicing. Yeah. I would be shouting. I would be passing it along to my children. I am leaving it as a heritage and a legacy, telling them about how God delivered us out. I mean, we've been in bondage for 400 years, but God... Uh, it had been a hard life for our people, but God, we built cities with long hours, whips beating us, no food at times, but God, uh, talk about stress, talk about dis depression, talk about anxiety, talk about going home dog tired, but God, you better believe there's going to be a celebration because God delivered us out of that slavery. We're set free from that taskmaster. I was so depressed, but God stepped in. I was so anxious, but God. I was so caught up in that sinful habit, but God. I was so down and out, but God, but God, but God, he took care of Pharaoh. Not only did I leave Egypt, but God blessed me with the riches of the land. I didn't leave poor. I left rich. They paid me to leave Egypt. Yeah. When Pharaoh tried to hunt me down, it looked open. Hopeless. The end was near. There was no way out. The Red Sea in front. Pharaoh's arm.
army behind, but God, the sea split. I walk through on dry ground. Don't you see it, church? But but God, God said, I am that I am. When you need me to be the wind to blow back the water, I am that wind. When you need me to cause your enemy to be confused long enough for you to crop over, I am that confusion. But God, there's a celebration day because of the deliverance out of Egypt. Oh, you believers this morning, there needs to be a day of celebration because you have walked out of Egypt and God stepped into your situation and set you free this morning. But God. Now third, as if that wasn't enough, they had a celebration of when the law was given on Mount Sinai. <laughs> he knew that when a law was given, there would be a celebration. Wow. Think about it. Congress passes a law. Yay! Woohoo! <laughs> no. <laughs> but here in Scripture, this meant that Israel was now going to be a great nation. God's people. Remember that when they went into Egypt, there was about 80 of them. But when they came out of Egypt, there was 2.4 million of them. That's a pretty good size start to a nation, isn't it? However, what's the best part of this? Is that they were to live as God's very own people on earth. They were to thank God for himself and for his law, the rules and principles he had given to govern their lives and nation. He had given them, not that man had created, not that man had come up with. God did. God chose them. God had given them. These were not bylaws that the leaders came up with because of some situation that had arisen in, in, the, in the nation. These were God's laws. These were God's rules. These were God's principles. It is important to note that the Jews figured the law had been given to Moses some 50 days after the Exodus. Think about it. God was calling his people, setting up his people with how they should live. If they would follow his commands, if they would follow his law, he would be their God. He would protect them. He would bless them. He would dwell with them. Yeah. He chose them. He could have chosen anybody, but he chose them. Do you realize that with those commands that he gave them, that he gives us, that if we obey them, if we live by them, if we live by those commands and we apply them to our lives, that we'd be a whole lot better off than we are today. If we just honor the first one, I have no other gods before him. I mean, Christ said all of them are wrapped up into two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's all ten of them wrapped up right there. Wow. If we just... Okay. Never mind. 
All right, quickly. Let's look at the providence of God. Now we've looked at looked at some of the, the history, right? Let's look at the providence of God, how all three events were fulfilled in the coming of the Holy Spirit, 50 days after the resurrection. When Pentecost was fully come, the first fruits were born. The church itself and the har- and the first harvest of souls. The new beginning. The filling of the Holy Spirit. It all began 50 days after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Right here in this chapter, we see Peter standing, preaching, and and declaring the word of God. And I mean, he declares it. He points it right out. The Jews are all sitting there accusing them of being drunk. And Peter stands up and he says, these guys aren't drunk as you suppose. These guys are filled with the Holy Spirit. And he starts talking about Jesus Christ. And he says, Jesus Christ, who you killed, who you crucified. Oh, do you know that if I started preaching like that to you guys, you guys would be hunting a new preacher. (laughs) Seriously. And yet when he finished preaching, they said, what must we do to be saved? And 3,000 were saved that day. 3,000 were delivered that day. 3,000 souls were harvested for the kingdom that day. In one day, a huge day of celebration. In one day. By one person, in one sermon. What a day of shouting and celebration went on that day, huh? Wow. The church was born. The church, not the little C church that the Pharisees were ruling over. God's church was born that day. Wow. Number two, second, the coming of the Holy Spirit had a very specific purpose. And that purpose was to live and work in the heart of every believer. To deliver and free us from the enslavements of this world. Whoa. Have we heard that before? Didn't we say that about leaving Egypt? The Holy Spirit works to deliver us from sin, death, and hell itself. The Holy Spirit comes to whisper in our ears and says, Hey, uh, walk away from that. Uh, You don't need that. Don't go down that road. There's danger over there. You know, like on that uh, show, uh, Lost in Space, Danger, Will Robinson, Danger. God's got something better for you. There's a greater gift for you. There's forgiveness. There's now no condemnation. You're God's child. You're no longer a slave to that thing. You can have your mind renewed. You don't have to be conformed to the things of this world. You can have your mind transformed. Change your mind this morning. Change your mind right now. You're the head and not the tail. You're the first and not the last. You're bought with a price. You're a royal priesthood. You're a child of the king. You're the bride of Christ. You have the power to tread over serpents and scorpions this morning. You have nothing to fear because I am with you. Oh, do you understand this this morning? What it means to be delivered from the enslavement of the world. Do you really understand that you are no longer in bondage to Pharaoh this morning? Do you really understand this morning that you no longer, as a believer, live in Egypt this morning? Oh, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if, if you have accepted the gift of God, if you have opened the door of your heart, if you've confessed your sins, He is faithful and just and will cleanse you from all of, all unrighteousness and you walk 
out of Egypt. That means that you're in the world, but you're not of the world. This world is gone. You're free. Turn and face the enemy one more time, and what you see behind you, you will never see again. Today they die. Today they're defeated. Today they can't hurt you again because you are no longer a part of them. You are a part of the kingdom of God. You don't believe me? You need to study Romans 6. Uh, shall I say? Or shall I go and say? You said the grace being preached by no means. We've died to sin. How can I live in it any longer? I've been raised to a new life through Jesus Christ. Number three, the coming of this, uh, of the Holy Spirit was two things. It was the birth of the church, the new people of God. Up to this point, Israel, the Jews, they were God's people. Now the temple veil was torn in two. Access is granted to everyone. Those who came to God were now sealed they were now known by the presence of the Holy Spirit, by His very presence in their hearts and their lives. And when you allow the Spirit of God to move in you, people see it. People know it. People can tell there's something different about you. There's something better about you. There's something changed about you. People who know you will start to talk differently to you. They'll come up to you and they'll say, you changed. Uh, there's something about your face that's different. Did you get a nose job? <laughs> there's something about your teeth that I've never noticed before. I've never seen them. <laughs> and now I see them. What's up with you? What happened to you? You don't talk like you used to. You don't act like you used to. You don't hang out where you used to. What's up with all that? You don't read what you used to. You don't look at things on the internet that you used to. There's something different about you. I like the new you. Uh, actually, I'll take some of what you got. You see, that's the spirit working in you. So all of you that are introverts, that's the spirit working in you. That's the spirit working through you. That's the spirit sealing you. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22 says, Now he would establish it, us with you in Christ and have anointed us is God, who have also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Second, it was the institution of the new law, the new rule, the new principle of God. We are now guided by the Spirit who empowers us to live right and to serve Christ. John 14, 26, 26 says it best. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. All the things that Christ teaches us, the Holy Spirit brings to mind as we allow it. Oh, it was an exciting day. A day of great anticipation. A day of great expectation. The Holy Spirit was coming. The governor was coming. It came. It killed them. He was preached. The church was born. The harvest of the first fruits was established. The spirit, the, the same spirit that came that day is here today. He is working in our midst today. The question is, what is he saying to you today? 
How is he leading you today? Uh, do you need some of that? Is he leading you to a deeper relationship with Jesus? Are there things that he's telling you this morning? Hey, you need to confess this. Hey, you need to surrender that. Hey, you need to praise God for this. Hey, you need to give thanksgiving for that. What's he whispering in your ear this morning? Maybe it's to be praying for that person next to you. Or you might be saying, well, wait a minute, I don't know their need. That's all right. Just start praying for them and let the Spirit lead you. Whatever it is, follow His lead. Don't try and lead in this dance. When you dance with your wife or your husband, you might try and lead them. But don't lead the Spirit, let the Spirit lead you. I'm telling you, you'll be better off in the end. Let's stand together.